Pollock Park again and today we're going to talk about how to encourage children to get into the garden through play. We've brought along a, a longtime Richmond Garden Club, Club member, Megan Zenny, and Megan is also a volunteer with the Master Gardeners. So she's a, a very experienced um, uh, fellow gardener and she's going to teach us how to play in the garden today. Megan? Hi. So I'm Megan Zenny. Uh, I'm actually a teacher here in the Richmond School District and I'm uh, working at the same time on my PhD at UBC looking at uh, how we encourage children to learn and play outdoors and how teachers might do that. So one of the ways that we can get kids playing and learning in gardens is um, through fairy gardens. So when we think about uh, gardens that we have, this is the fairy garden here at Pollock Park that they've got a little corner here. Uh, when we think about gardens, there should never be, um, if you're going to have children in it, a garden that's so precious that children can't be in it. And I think it's really important that we have little spots and places for children to play. Now, these are uh, some of the permanent features here in this fairy garden and I brought along some other pieces that might um, encourage play in your garden. So a lot of these are inexpensive little pieces that you can pick up at dollar stores. These are, they can be painted and I'm, I'm not sure if you can see here that there's a little birdhouse that's been painted and hung from the tree here and we do that often in our school gardens. We will um, spend time painting and decorating or even building. You can actually build these from scratch paint the fairy houses or the gnome houses uh, and I often recommend putting a shellac over them or some kind of mod podge to keep them weatherproofed because if you just put it out like this it probably won't last more than one season but if you mod podge it or shellac it it will last for several years. So adding these into the landscape gives a bit of whimsy to the space which makes it more appealing for children to play in. Um, some of the materials that we can add you can purchase that are already made. So this is an example of a fairy door that's already been made and manufactured and you can add those in to your spaces for a little more imaginative play. Um, and there are lots of supplies that you can purchase like gnomes or fairies that can be added into your playscape. But you can also use other pieces that have less descriptive play features to them. So uh, when we speak about play, children's play, we often talk about the affordance of the play material. So something that is very described. So for example, this material, this is a, a plastic butterfly that is going to last a long time if it's left outside. It's a perfectly suitable material to leave outside in your garden all the time. It is a, a, a lower affordance material than, for example, this pine cone might be. And that's because the butterfly is very clearly a butterfly. And so by playing with it, we're probably going to encourage children to be playing and telling butterfly stories with a butterfly. And that's okay. We can add that into our little playscape here. And when I add something like a pine cone, this can be anything. He could be a troll, he could be a gnome, he could be um, anything I want him to be, anything that my imagination can imagine. I can put him in and children who have some experience with imaginative play will then take this material and adjust it to whatever they need for their playscape. There's other materials that we can add to our fairy gardens. These are called peg dolls and they are very neutral. So there's no faces on the doll. So as a player, as a child, I can imagine that these are happy or sad or afraid or astonished. I can put any kind of feeling or emotion onto these characters, um, which is different, for example, than this little fairy here who's covering her eyes and that might restrict how I would play with her because she's, she's clearly in some kind of state that I would have to create a story to match the way that she's been presented. So these kinds of materials offer, often offer children um, a more imaginative way to play. And so you can paint these, you can use markers or Sharpies, um, and if you don't have a lot of materials to paint them, just leave them blank and children will uh, imprint on them what works for the story that they're telling right now. So you can leave those out for play and you'll be surprised that when you don't actually tell children how to play that they will imagine something that you would never even have imagined. Other materials that we can put in our fairy gardens that encourage play, um, we can just find in the garden. So lots of different interesting kinds of sticks 
you know, this can become um, anything. It could become a, a tail of something. It could become a, a cyclone. Um, it could become some kind of magic wand and this is the spiral that's coming from the from the magic that we've created. I can tell all kinds of stories using these sticks that I, any child picking these up and playing with them would a thousand children would tell a thousand different stories. And that gives them a really high affordance for high quality play when we're in our garden spaces. And so we just add them and we sort of just leave them left about and children will pick them up and play with them. Uh, chestnuts are another easily accessed loose part. These are often called loose parts in education circles. Um, that term, if you've heard it before, simply means that it can be used in any way you want. Um, a player, a person who is picking up this material can use it in any way they wish. So I might add this chestnut because it might become some kind of troll that's all tucked up. It might become a table. It might become a bowling ball. It might be anything. Uh, a pumpkin like this, you can pick these up at the dollar store. This of course has a lower affordance as a loose part because it is clearly a pumpkin. But if I didn't have this and all I had was the chestnut and I needed some pumpkins, you can imagine that a child would start turning these into pumpkins. And so there's lots of different ways that we can use loose parts for imaginative play. So we can use the actual pumpkins, but we can also just use chestnuts. Uh, shells are another nice loose part that we can add into our imaginative play. and often we'll keep them in the gardens in the school gardens in little metal tins or we just keep them in little piles and we leave them out all the time we don't put them away we just leave them out so those can be added to your playscape and used in all kinds of uh, imaginary ways uh, tree cookies are another nice piece to add they can be used as uh, maybe some magic steps over the lava so that you have to step on these to get to where you need to go or they could be used to stack up as a tower, potentially. We could make another sort of chimney over here. We could make this, if we didn't have this, we could actually just build our own little gnome home using random little pieces of wood that we find that are interesting. And so when we provide these materials for play, children will come up with all kinds of stories. We can use pieces like this that we can buy at the dollar store, welcome, and add a few other pieces if we want. But I can also just look around me and start picking up interesting looking pieces and children will, if you provide the materials, they will play. And so just leaving these out in the garden is a great way to create a fairy garden. Um, I did bring a book that is supporting, sometimes when children need a little encouragement to play, if children don't have a lot of experience with unstructured play or imaginary play, if they don't have a lot of that in their life, sometimes this can be a little confusing. They look at it and they don't know what to do with it. So uh, in school, sometimes what we do is, uh, for those children that have come to school without a lot of imaginary play in their early childhood years, we'll introduce an idea with a book. Uh, and so this is a nice story that introduces the idea of backyard fairies. It's a book by Phoebe Wall, mm -hmm. and it's a story about a little girl who goes out into her backyard and she asks you, have you ever found, well, out on your own, a tiny magical somebody's home, right? And then she goes through and she explores what might be living in these places. And so by tweaking curiosity or imagination or wonder, we can encourage play in these play spaces. And what's also really nice to do is if you have these spaces, either in public parks like this Pollock Park or in your own home garden or in school gardens, we can leave them out and then the next group of children that come will build on the play and they will uh, imagine something new based on the scene that has been left. Um, Right now, with the pandemic and with the, uh, the virus, we've taken away a lot of our materials in the public schools. Um, we don't have our materials out right now in our school garden, but they'll be back at some point. I'll take thanks. that for you. Yeah, thanks. And so you can set these up in your own yard and you don't even need to have a big garden. You can just have a little patch of grass. Um, you can use, this is a woven mat, like a placemat that we picked up from Ikea. There's lots of different ways that you can set your scene and you can just do this in your backyard, you can do this in a garden space, you can do this under a tree, it can be done anywhere. And a fairy garden doesn't have to have special things, it can just, whatever you add to it can become special. So uh, I brought some of my books, not all of them, but a few of them, just to talk about uh, some of the books that we can read with kids that are about uh, or exciting or um, engaging them in thinking about being in gardens. 
So one of the series of books that I like by Frank Serafini is called Looking Closely and this is one of his books called Looking Closely in the Garden. And what it does is it encourages children to take some time and look very closely. So you can see, look very closely. What do you see? A stained glass window, a jigsaw puzzle. What could it be? And most of us know what this is, but if you're a young child without experience with a monarch butterfly, you might be surprised to know that it's a monarch butterfly and there's some nice information about the monarch butterfly. And the book goes on and it gives you some rhymes and it explains what all of these items are. So that's a nice way to look closely in the garden. And another way that we encourage kids to look closely in the garden sometimes is we use um, paint chips. So if you have, I've done a painting project around your house and you have some of these paint chips, or if you're uh, at a garden center and you collect some of them, we'll take them out in the garden and have them see if they can find that color. And so it encourages children to slow down and look closely and spend some time with the plants. Because sometimes if we have not just children, but any of us, children or adults, who don't spend a lot of time outside. When you look around, you might say, I might say to you, what color do you see? And you might say it's green, but there's a lot of different variety of green. And so that kind of greenwashing that happens is a result of not spending enough time in nature. So when we invite children to look closely and we give them some ways to look closely, we can excite them to pay attention to what's happening in the garden and to notice that growth over time. Uh, some of the other books that I encourage, uh, Rotten Pumpkin is a nice one for looking closely. So when you are done with your jack-o'-lanterns, uh, this is a story about a, a jack-o'-lantern and the decomposition process. And so you learn about who some of the visitors are to the jack-o'-lantern, uh, who might be um, trying to break away at the shell of the pumpkin and eating at that and all that ecosystem around the decomposing pumpkin and how we have this biodiversity of life that is living in a decomposing pumpkin. So there's all kinds of rots and molds and yeasts and funguses that we'll learn to identify by going through this book and seeing more about the insects. So it's a nice story. And in the end, we see when we go through the whole process of decomposition that the seeds are left and the seeds are actually protected from the decomposition process because they have a coat on them. And with children, we often talk about how we put on a coat to stay dry and warm and the seeds have a coat to keep them dry and warm. And so they are left from decomposing because they're back in the soil and they need some things to grow. And on my blog post on my website, I have lots of blog posts about what seeds need to grow. And eventually the life cycle starts again. So this is a nice story about looking closely, paying attention to decomposition, the importance of decomposition in our gardens and the life cycle. So that's another one for having children look closely. Um, other ones that are interesting that I enjoy with kids, uh, Flip Float Fly, Seeds on the Move, talks a lot about how seeds travel. So this is a book by um, Joanne Early Mackin. And this story goes through how different kinds of seeds have different kinds of characteristics that help them travel. So you can learn about the seeds that are growing and how they escape their mother plant and how they find new ways to travel. So this is a fun one. It floats, right? Some seeds float, some seeds fly, some seeds pop out of the flowers. So I like flip, float, fly. That's a nice one. Uh, for younger children, how does a seed grow? I really like this one. It's by Sue Kim. And it's a really easy, simple, familiar rhyme. Tomato seed, tomato seed, how do you grow? Deep in the soil, I'll plant my roots. So the roots go down. And this is what the tomato seed looks like. And the shoot goes up with sunshine and water come the shoots. And then what does a grown up tomato look like? There it is. Right? So hooray for plump tomatoes. And the whole story goes through and looks at all the different kinds of plants. So we've got blueberries and pepper seeds and we've got peas, right? We're planting pea seeds right now. So pea seeds can go in your garden this week if you haven't planted them already. So pea seeds, pea seeds, how do you grow? And this is what a pea seed looks like. And it says in well-drained soil warmed by sunshine. So the first thing it does is puts its shoots into the soil and then the, the roots go down and the shoot goes up, up curls a sprout that will soon be a vine. And that's what the pea pods look like. So that's another one of my favorite books to look with kids to get them excited about 
growing in the garden. Uh, tops and bottoms is a lot of fun. This is a really great story about a very lazy bear and a very um, industrious rabbit. And so in Tops and Bottoms, what we learn is that the rabbit has a lot of children to feed that are very hungry. And the bear is a little bit lazy. And here's the rabbit with all his bunnies and he needs to feed them. So he goes to talk to the bear and he says, listen, bear, you've got all this land and I've got all these kids. Can I plant something in your garden? And the bear says, all right, but I get half of everything you grow. So the rabbit, because he's very tricky, he goes ahead and he weeds the garden and he does some planting and the bear is sleeping and he doesn't have any knowledge of what's happening. So when the harvest comes, the rabbit gives the bear all the tops and he keeps all the bottoms. So he keeps all the roots, all the carrots and all the radishes and all the beets and all of the root crops. So the bear is not very happy about that. So he says, wait a second, you've totally tricked me. I don't like that. So do it again. And this time I get all the bottoms and you can have the tops. So if you know anything about vegetables, you know that that tricky rabbit is going to trick him again. So the bear is sleeping and the crops are growing. And now the bear gets all the roots and the rabbits take all the broccolis and the celeries and the lettuces and all of the tops. So of course the bear is now furious because he's been tri tricked twice by those rabbits. He says, that's it, this time you're gonna do it again and I get the tops and the bottoms. And I'm not gonna ruin the book for you, but the rabbit tricks him again. There's another way that he tricks him. So if you're interested in knowing how that book ends, it's called Tops and Bottoms by Janet Stevens. And that is one of my favorite books to read with kids as well. Uh, Plant the Tiny Seed is really nice for young children to think about how our seeds grow and it is by Christy Matheson. So this is a really nice book that goes through all the things that seeds need to grow and in the end when they have oxygen and sun and rain we have flowers. So plant the tiny seed is a nice one. A seed of, a seed of Sleepy is a classic book that most libraries and schools will have um, and it has a lot of really great information. It's actually I would say it's one of the best non-fiction books in a fictional form. It's, it's got a lot of facts in it, so it's nice. So it talks about what seeds do and how long seeds can wait before they germinate. There's all kinds of information, okay? And what's really interesting is that some seeds, look at that one, it's called a hamburger bean. It looks like a little hamburger. What's interesting about this one is it shows us how some seeds are ancient. Some seeds have been found thousands of years later and they didn't have what they needed to grow, and scientists were able to germinate the seeds with the right conditions. So we've got the life cycle of a corn kernel and a bean, and a bean seed. Okay, seeds are clever, they know what they need to do. And I really, really like this book for its information. It's got nice information in it. Um, Lessons from Mother Earth by Elaine McLeod. Talks a lot about um, seasonal rounds and how the earth will provide if we don't take too much. So it's about and these books are all available at the public library and if they're not, um, we'll get them on their list. <laughs> so yep. right now I'm still in Pollock Park but there are always, no matter how beautiful a park is or how beautiful your garden is, there's always an area that nobody wants anybody to see and this we found ourselves a little patch of horsetail and if you're not familiar with horsetail it's a really interesting plant um, it's one of the oldest species of plants that we know that have stayed with us over the eons um, and it's never had to evolve when we look at how plants and animals adapt and evolve over time to um, survive in their circumstances horsetail's never had to do that and the reason it's never had to do that is because it's just perfectly invasive just the way it is so it doesn't have to work very hard to ruin our gardens. <laughs> and if you have horsetail in your garden, sometimes it shows up in soil delivery. You might not have had it before and then you get a delivery of soil from somewhere and it shows up. And if it's a brand new horsetail, you can usually stay on top of it and get rid of it. But if you've got a whole bunch of it like this, you kind of have to learn to live with it because it's really hard to get rid of. So when you have children and you have horsetail, 
and you don't want to make yourself crazy trying to dig this out all the time, what I recommend, because this is a prehistoric plant, that we add a prehistoric series of toys. So we make horsetail and any other really invasive areas of uh, weeds in our gardens, dinosaur gardens. And you can just add your dinosaurs and you can leave them in there and kids can play with them and move them around. And they look right at home with all these horsetail. And the added benefit to that is if you have a lot of kids playing in here in your horsetail, it'll eventually stomp it down and reduce the amount of horsetail you have. Um, I do have a blog post on my website uh, talking about other kinds of plants that are really great for adding dinosaurs to if you're lucky enough not to have a horsetail problem. Uh, kale is a very sort of prehistoric looking plant that you can add your dinosaurs to. If you've got lots of kale or you want to plant some kale, you can add your dinosaurs to that as well for a dinosaur garden, which is kind of a fun way to garden with kids. This is another example of loose parts play. So you don't need anything in particular. You just need to hold space for children to be allowed to play like this. And this is a very valuable form of play for children of all ages. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, and it's really great for kids to just be able to go into any space, like Pollock Park or your backyard or any space, pick up some sticks and make something from nothing. And I love this. And I'm seeing this all over Richmond right now. I see it all down on the beaches, down by the river, um, with all of our playgrounds closed and a lot of our other play structures not available to children. If you just give them some space and some time, they will create something amazing. And this is super fun and super amazing. So I'm so glad to see that it's happening here. today how to get children engaged in being in a garden and enjoying that space and getting healthy and getting some wonderful um, uh, stimulation of enjoying nature from Megan Zenny so we'd like to thank you very much yeah, very informative the books as Megan uh, mentioned they are uh, should be available at Richmond Public Library you can check that out but for our next, um, uh, I love the dinosaur by the way, for our next video, we're gonna learn how to take these plants and create more plants through layering, propagating, dividing, all kinds of things. And right behind me, you're hearing children play. Thank you.